first announce the upcoming events that we have. We only have three more events before we take our summer break. We have uh, on May 23rd at the Minneapolis Club with the founder, Rick Romacum, who's right here. He's gonna have an event on, on acquisitions. Um, and then on June 6th, he's gonna also have an event called the Next Big Money Sports Trend, Legalized Sports Betting. So if you'd like to get on his list, um, please uh, reach out to him. And then we're back here in St. Paul, June 19th, um, and it's written by a marketing person, it's, so it's called Sticky Note Simple Sales. Um, and that's about, uh, for anyone who's interested in moving the sales needle now and needs an injection of, an, of simple action to do so. So I, I have a little bit of a laryngitis, so if you come next month, my voice will sound a little better. So um, I want to thank our sponsors um, that uh, support our luncheons, the University Club, Olsen Thielen CPAs, a regional accounting and consulting firm, the Irish Titan, an e-commerce digital agency. We actually have uh, Terry here with us representing, oh, there she is, and uh, Winthrop and uh, Weinstein, um, and myself uh, with uh, employee recruiting and retention through employee benefits. Um, and I'm really excited to have our panelists. And uh, with that, since we don't have that much time, I would love just to uh, introduce the panelists and then have you guys talk about your roles um, and, and uh, what your role is in regards, in, in regards to culture and engagement in your organization. So we'll start first with Jamie Tates with Keystone Group. Perfect, thank you. Thanks for being here, everybody. Um, Key, Jamie Tates, Keystone Group International, and so um, my role in our organization is the founder and CEO. Um, and our organization kind of in this discussion has a little twofold because I have a team, right, that we have to maintain a culture and really drive the values but we also provide services to businesses in helping them understand culture and really what makes it you know, change, what can make it change for the worse or for the better. Um, and so my role is to make sure that we are driving, both in our business and in other businesses, the strongest culture to truly create a competitive advantage. Um, and, and that's why I think this, this conversation and this panel is so important because the businesses that can figure this out in the next 10 years are gonna be the ones that truly have a competitive advantage with the talent you know, deficit that we're in right now and that will continue to grow. Yes, Alicia Webb with the Village Bank. Hi, can everyone hear me? Hi, I'm Alicia Webb and I'm the president of Village Bank. And when I think about what my job is, um, it's interesting because today is just being part of a village and our village is um, built on values and that's why we we do not have a deficit of talent. I I awesome. had and I'll explain that. I just had um, lunch with another banker last week, and he said to me, "How are you hiring? How are you guys hiring talent?" And although I'd love to say we hire talent on skill set and experience in the industry, um, that's not it. <laughs> to be really blunt with you, it's based on our values. And every single time we're meeting someone, we're saying, "Do you want to build something?" Are you an achiever? Are you a lifetime learner? Um, do you do the right thing, even when it's really, really tough? And so today, that's what we're doing. Um, that's how we're hiring, and that's why we don't have a deficit today. Um, it's a change. It's different. Not everyone's comfortable with it. I think we were just talking at the table. It's a lot of tough conversations, but it is based on values. And I think that's really, really important, and I'm excited to talk more about that today. Laura Kim from Core Talent. Hello. I, it doesn't seem like this is odd, but if it, it is, if it is, it's okay. Well, hello everyone. I am going to come at this conversation from a little bit different angle in that I work for Core Talent. We are a retained search firm. I've been in recruiting for about 14 years, and it's my job to dissect a company culture. And I have found so much success in my career, not from my ability to find a skill set, but finding the match. Mm. And that's a little bit of art, a little bit of science, and I'm excited to, to share more throughout the, uh, the lunch. Great, and I have a, a large list of questions, but if anybody has a question they'd like addressed, please raise your hand, I'll, I'll look for you, and you can certainly um, 
have your question answered. I mean, we're here for you, the audience, but I'll start us uh, with questions. And anytime you want a and ask, to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, so with that, uh, if you guys could each talk about where you are in your culture turning journey, you know, if you're establishing, if you're redefining, evolving, or sustaining, um, and what approach you've taken around the culture in your organization. Mm -hmm. Sir? I'll, I'll, go, I'll go for okay. it. This is a good question for us. So um, Jamie's the founder and CEO of her company, but guess who ours is? It's my dad. So think about how fun that is at times. Marla, don't type that on social media. <laughs> um, so Christmas is fun. Christmas is you know interesting. Um, but we're, we are lucky. We have our CEO, our founder, our chairman, and owns 100% of the bank. And so he's involved. That culture is really built around what his values are and so what we've really focused on is how do we take what his core values are what our village values are and we went through a long exercise based on what are my values and what have what's gone on during you know my 42 years and how have I gotten to where I'm at how has he gotten to where he's at and we're, we're we've blended those and we said where where do they align and why do they align? And did we call them something different? Or are they really the same? And how is that going to take us on to the next 26 years? So as we look at what the village values are, it's hopefully giving a lot of confidence, even with change, but it's a lot of confidence to our team and our village that we've got another 26 years, right? Um, and that exercise has been really interesting because what it's done is it's given us confidence so when we're making decisions and we're making changes whether they're good they're difficult um they're for the future they're to keep what we've already got in place we can always make those decisions really confidently because they're based on the values that we have and we recently had this um piece at work where there was some different things that had gone on and i said oh no that couldn't have happened and they're like why not and i said well because that's not who she is and ultimately, it didn't happen that way And because it's not who that person is. And I think that when you do hire based on values, you just know people are going to do the right thing. They're going to um, address situations a certain way because that's, that's who they are, right? Um, it's been fun to watch, too, the villagers that have been at the bank for a long time and how they how they are understanding where their values are and why they align with the company and how the opportunities that they're finding. I mean, I can keep picking on Marla here, but there's a lot of them there that how they're finding themselves and the new opportunities for them too. So it's been, um, it's been a fun ride so far. And, um, you know, one thing that we always talk about within our organization and with our clients is that culture is not self-sustaining. So when you ask the question about if you're building, I think when your business is new, you're building it whether it's just you or you have employees, and then from there, you're evolving. You're constantly evolving, and it's the businesses that understand that and that they know that each new hire has an impact on your culture. It can be positive or negative, and you have to be very, very aware of that, and you have an opportunity every week, every month, every quarter to adjust that and say, you know, we've veered off track and we need to come back and evolve it back. And it, there's nothing wrong with your culture changing. I think people feel like it has to be the way it always was. It has to evolve to attract the right people and to, as your business evolves, because if your business is staying the same, then you're probably dying from a business standpoint. Um, so I would just say you should always be evolving. And if you're not evolving, then that's actually the issue that you should be solving for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can speak from personal experience. I have been with Core Talent for three months. I was with a different search firm um, prior to that, and I actually had to wait out and not compete. So I was the biggest um, sort of change agent that had been, I didn't even want to call myself a change agent. I am shaking up the culture in my current organization, and that's a really hard role because I feel isolated. Um, I'm having to build relationships with other people on the executive leadership team, um, but I have commitment from our president and CEO that this is what she wants, right? And, and, and it's, um, it's hard mm -hmm. <laughs> managing change and just getting through those, um, those messy, um, what I call courageous conversations. Mm -hmm. But um, I will tell you, I had um, a really great opportunity 
to go to Atlanta about two weeks ago with the two others on, on my leadership team. And it was great to see them outside of the office and be able to connect person to person and find that we actually have a lot in common um, and that I'm not, I'm not here to steal your job, I'm not here to do, you know, and, and finding that sort of human to human mm -hmm. connection mm -hmm. outside, of, outside of the workplace. I just want to add to that a little because that's a really good point that Laura's making is the other thing that we see with a lot of business leaders is we want to evolve the culture and then when it gets hard, we step back because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or we don't want to make anybody feel bad. But as leaders in our organizations, it's our job to go through the change and push the team through the change. You can't go around it. You can't go over it. You have to go through it if you want it to be different on the other side. And I think that's exactly what you're experiencing. And, and you, can't, you can't stop when you're that close to really driving the change. I think that's the hardest thing. I know, Jamie, you talked about uh, your, a culture always evolving. Where, for the leaders listening, where do you know where to start and, and how to make an assessment of where you are today? And uh, kind of a, a, a two-part question, what advice would you give them on where to start, how to assess where they are, and where, where to begin? Do we talk, I don't think we touched on it much. No, that's the, that's the magic question there. Um, the other piece about culture, when that it's not self-sustaining, is also that it's not, culture is not, taking your team to the Twins game and having a team barbecue in the summer. And I, I say that, you know, tongue in cheek, but that's what uh, they think that we did that. Yeah, we, we checked the culture box this year. Yep, we got that part done. And that's not, that's not culture at all. And in fact, the word culture is, I, I wish I could think of another term to use because I could probably be really popular in the market. But, you know, the word culture, people are kind of almost immune to it. They're kind of sick of hearing about it. But the way we look at it is there's five components to culture. Um, the first one, and we've got, if anybody, we've got kind of an image that we have that, that shows this, is there's the foundational elements, which are things like accountability, having a clear vision, right, having strong leadership, not just people in boxes. Like, that's all part of your culture. And, and so many of us think about the other elements, but we don't think about that foundation. So if we do the fun stuff, and we've got the, the kegerator and the ping pong table, which there's nothing wrong with that, right, if it works for your business, um, but you don't have any of the foundational elements, you have zero return on investment for the things that you're doing. And so the foundational elements matter, the team elements matter, the individual elements matter, and the company elements matter. And then that's ultimately what drives even your external culture then. Right? How are you portrayed out to the market? And so when we work with businesses, we're looking at all those levels. We're heat mapping that entire, that entire space to say, you might have the team collaboration thing down, but there's probably other areas that you know, aren't getting you the most lift from that that you have to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, asking you a question. So how yeah. would you assess so say I'm a leader, and mm -hmm. I think my culture is one way, mm -hmm. but in reality, I have all these other people telling me it's something else. Would you start with a survey? How would you first capture like what is? So we, we, focus, on, um, we focus on a 90-day culture reboot is what we do because we don't believe it's not a week. It's not a couple of conversations. Um, and we come in, in the, and again, this is not just because this is what we do. I truly believe it's someone from the outside coming in and giving you a different view of the world because at the top you see what you see but you only see 10 feet into the fog and, and you can't be expected to know all the way down but truly changing your culture means you push it to the front lines your values and you know what you guys are experiencing with villages because it's getting pushed all the way out into the organization so we recommend that kind of 90-day reboot where it's a series of one-on-one -on -one executive and indiv individual contributor interviews with a set set of questions, a survey as well. And then it's really looking at those and comparing to other businesses and saying, here's some of the gaps, right? If we heat map it, here are some of the areas that you really need to think about. Um, but I just feel very strongly, and even for my organization, we have people that are helping us from the outside because I think it's really hard for you to see the forest through the trees. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll feed off of what they both said. So it is difficult because you know, we all want to be fun. We want to be liked. We want, you know, I mean, I'm red and yellow. It's uh, be bold, be brief, be gone. <laughs> and then my second is team. Have fun, play on a team, teamwork. How are we going to do this together? And so it's difficult when you hear, quote, unquote, people aren't happy. Okay, well, my, I can't manage happy. 
What I can manage, what I can do for our culture is I can have a reliable culture. I can have a culture where I can commit to my, to my villagers that I'm going to increase the amount of money we spend on benefits every single year. We've had half a million this last year. My plan is to do another half a million this year and continue to take our profit and put it back into the company so we get to where we need to be. Um, for our village, you know, we can commit to communication and over communicating. It's never enough. I, I mean, it will never be enough. But there's only thing you don't you can't communicate till you know, right? Things move fast. Um, and so there's like these peop there's these pieces that although I can't commit to making every single person happy. I mean, like ask my husband, ask my children, ask my best <laughs> friends. I can commit to reliability. I can commit to a vision, and I can commit to over communicating as much as I possibly can. And I think like that's the piece that we get back down to, is that um, no matter what you're doing in life, no matter what it is, school, marriage, life, children, your religion, whatever it is you've got to make yourself happy and you've got to have standards and you can't worry all the time about um, if you're going to be liked but really having that 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 vision and having that this is where we're getting to guys and how can we get there and it's not always about how do I get your job but it's about making that commitment at your desk and realizing that you're a resource at what you do today and you can make the village better your own life better if you really commit to what you do today and you do it your very very best and what resources can I give to you so you can be your best? Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's, as a, as a woman and as a team, I mean, I've been part of other teams for the last decade. Like, I miss having a team, and I miss having, um, I've got it, I mean, I've got a great senior leadership team, and the village is 80 plus families that we that I feel a big responsibility to take care of but yeah you don't want to share everything all the time because it's tough decisions and it gets messy at times and being that change and it's okay to say you're a change maker because that's why you were hired right and you've got a job to do and um you know it's it's kind of this way like I, I've got a two-year-old and she wants to walk down the stairs Okay, what do you think is going to happen if she walks down the stairs? I mean, who knows? The head, the nose, the arm, the whatever, right? And it's the same thing. We're FDIC. We're regulated. At times, I've got to, I've got to help out until I know that we're there. And um, it's a big job. It's unpopular at times, but it's really important because there's not a lot of local decision makers in finance. We're lucky in the Midwest, but we're, you know, you saw four big ones consolidate last year. So if you don't continue to change. You, are, you will be part of that consolidation, not by choice, but by it's the only route out, right? So you've got to continue to move forward. Okay, so um, Laura and I actually started at the same recruiting firm in 2005. So as a former recruiter, when you walk into a company, you do really notice the culture. And it does, as everybody talks about, it does uh, affect turnover when you're re recruiting and the people don't stay or they leave and you're recruiting again and you're like, I'm not recruiting for them anymore because they don't have the culture to sustain the placements that I make. So indicators like that, I mean, we're, we're talking about assessments and evolving, you know, when do you know when you really wanna make a change and, and why is it worth it? I mean, is it a turnover? And talk about some of those sort of issues on why you wanna make these changes and how it impacts your business because it, it's a big investment to make a culture change. It, was I clear on my question? So I'm going to disagree with you that it's a big investment to make a culture change. I think that is a myth that people believe that it's a big investment to make a culture change. It's, an, it's maybe an investment to bring somebody in to give you a real perspective on your culture, but to make the change is just hard work, you guys. <laughs> it doesn't cost, so the foundational elements I'm talking about with developing your leaders and having clear accountability and driving the vision for the organization are free. They take time. And as leaders in an organization, time is what we don't have. That, that's really the, the, you know, what, we're, what we're trading. But if we don't put in that work, I'll tell you, you know, we, we, I say this to business leaders all the time, is if the results is what we're driving for in absence of the culture and the trust and everything else, you can get to the finish line. You can achieve the results, but you're doing it a heck of a lot. It's taking you longer and it's way harder than it needs to be than if you focused in the inverse and you focused on your culture and the trust, the results come. And it's really hard to be in on that, 
but it's 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 focusing on that day in and day out and there's no perfect this is why culture is so hard because you can go read 10 books and you can go find 10 frameworks online and you could find our framework and it's hard because there's no one size fits all approach it's not go do these seven steps and you're going to have a great culture it has to be aligned to your values it has to be who you are where you're at in your business there are so many factors that that matter and I think that's why people don't step into it you know we just we just hope it gets better on its own because it's a lot of work but you, but I'll tell you in the next 10 to 15 years if you're not gonna do the work your business is in trouble I truly truly believe that because you're not gonna be able to retain and recruit the people you need to grow your business yeah so what I'll say is you know it starts at the top and so I think it takes a very self-aware leader mm -hmm. to you know, even, even admit that this is something that they want to work on and then igniting their leadership team that this is something I'm personally working on. And then they might see that in the way that the leader is changing, right? So I've seen leaders that, you know, they just go a mile a minute and they don't stop and really get to know the other people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's um, changing behavior and in, in saying, gosh, I know in the long run, this is actually going to be better for me to stop and actually take an employee out to lunch or ask them how their daughter's birthday party mm -hmm. was over the weekend and truly care, right? Because I talk to those employees that, you know, it, it's more just like a pass by, oh, how's your weekend? Oh, good, good, great, okay. Versus looking someone in the eye and actually feeling like that person cares about me. Mm -hmm. So this is where it comes to people now more than ever are all about, does my company care about me? And is what I'm doing, does it matter? So I don't know if it was that Daniel Pink was the autonomy mastering purpose. So those are the three that kind of guide, does someone have autonomy in what they're doing? Do they have mastery or have they you know, put their you know, so 10,000 hours in, so to speak, and then purpose? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm guessing we'll talk a little bit more about purpose, um, but I can tell you hands down, it's not because someone can't do the job is why they leave, mm -hmm. right? It's all because of that culture match. And companies are losing talent <laughs> because as we know, this market, whew, have you tried to recruit lately? <laughs> it's, it's tough. And when, when someone goes into a, an office and they can feel it, like there's something very magical about certain companies. Has anyone ever walked into a company and they felt like, just like lights and people are mm -hmm. laughing and talking and oh, this mm -hmm. is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, have you been into cultures where you immediately feel the energy <laughs> like, sucked out of you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like I've gone into some you know, everyone's head down with their headphones on and no one's really interacting very much. And so it, it, it's something that um, some of us are a little more intuitive and can pick that up right away. Um, and I could go on and on and on, but I won't, <laughs> but I'll leave it at, you know, just maybe think about taking that extra time. So we're all busy. Right, and it's it's so easy to write an email instead of just have a live dialogue with someone, but those live dialogues is what keeps people mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the best piece of advice I got when I went back to Village was make sure you hit up each of the offices every single week, and that's not easy, right? Because there's a lot going on, and and the, you got to get to the offices, and so. I've been hitting up the offices at least twice a month, and I'm talking about we've got five different um, offices, including an operations center, which is just as important as any of the other banks. And so we're driving around, we're doing this, and we're making sure it happens. And it is, it's impactful. You hear a lot that you normally wouldn't hear through an email or a you know state of the bank, whatever. Um, it's been really, it's been um, good to know. I, I'm an extrovert. I talk to anyone, meet someone at the grocery store. They become my best friend. Like, that's just who I am. With that being said, um, it's tough to kind of um, 
bear your soul like when you're in a position like this and like really ask for that raw feedback take that raw feedback in and um, be humble about that feedback and talk about what is going right and what is going wrong and ask for the feedback when it's not going right ask for the feedback when it is going right what could what could we have done differently to make this happen smoother etc um i also think that understanding i'm in a very old old business banking right there was a church there was a business or a bank um in every new town and then i'm in a very male dominated business which is just fine i love the guys i work with i love the guys i've learned from but it's different it is it's different you know i um all meet with WPO and there's always a personal story there. I'll meet with my CEO round table. I'm the only woman. They put me on so they could recruit other woman, women. I'm still the only wom woman after three years. There's never a personal story. I mean, I mean, there just isn't. And that's just what it is. And I think um, it's figuring out how you make change that makes sense for everyone around the table because you have to have buy-in. You can't ever do it on your own. Um, and being really fast to fail when you fail and admitting you fail. Um, one, I'll tell you about a failure. Um, so I worked for banks that are like 14 billion, right? I mean, publicly traded, et cetera. Um, and so when I came home, I said, okay, well, billion dollar Twin Cities Bank, that's what makes sense. It's the market, it's the industry, it's the compliance costs, et cetera. And, um, you know, all the reasons why we need to mitigate being in strategically in one area, blah, blah, blah. That scared everyone to death. We're 300 million. We've never been bigger than that. Like, I mean, p people looked at me like I was like a unicorn or a devil or whatever they thought. I mean, you can attest to that. You don't have to, but you can attest to that. And 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 I was like, well, what's wrong with these people? Don't they see what's going on in the industry? Don't they read the business journal? I mean, look what's happening in the statistics say this, and this is what you have to do. And like, I had all my reasons. I'm smart. Well, but I'm turning their world around, and I'm telling them they're not good enough, and I'm telling them they're not big enough, and why haven't they done it, and will they be able to do it, and are they going to live up to that, and what would their position be, and how would it change? And I didn't hear any of that. Like, I didn't. I didn't see that. I didn't feel it. I didn't hear it. Well, I sure as hell feel it now. I'll tell you that. And like, that's where you have to pause and you have to say, okay, got it. I've got to live in this world for a little while before I can start to know what else. I, I know what else. I got it. Like, that's why I came home. But it's not very polite to walk into Jamie's house and say, I'm going to change your wallpaper. That's, I don't like that wallpaper. <laughs> right? And that's basically what I did. <laughs> I've let you do it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I mean, seriously, so before you change the wallpaper, before you, you know, you make your big comments and your statements, it's really important to recognize when you do that, say you're sorry, um, and really like get in and live in the house before you change the wallpaper, right? So, we, we, you know, both Laura and Alicia have touched on it, and Alicia, you were visiting the offices. Um, I guess I want to ask the question directly here of a creative and inexpensive ways to increase retention, um, engagement, and performance in your workplace. You know, just realistic, actionable ideas that uh, people, people can start implementing in their businesses today or immediately. Okay, I've got a really good one. Okay, this is like, again, we talked, um, so, I have to go, I've got like some game changer, like I got some hard stops that I do. So on Tuesday nights, it's baby back float too. I go swimming with my daughter and Wednesday nights, um, I do I p do dance pickup. Those are my hard stops. I don't ever miss that stuff. I won't ever miss it. So what's been so fun is my bathroom chats. <laughs> like I have to go to the bathroom and change from a suit to a, you know, swim target swimsuit and some sweats and go to dance. I, all the ladies in the bank, tellers, relationship banker, all, they tell me their feelings. They tell me what happened. They tell me what did happen, what didn't happen. It is amazing because I would never have these moments with these ladies. I know who made their remote deposit goals for the month early. I know, you know, who's pregnant. I know, like, all the little secrets that no one knows yet because we've had these little moments. And it's, it's, I've realized through this that, like, to take the time to slow down. Mm 
right? And so now I've been strategic on having yeah. those visits on Tuesdays. So someone has to run into me in the bathroom and someone's got to see me in sweats <laughs> before I walk out the door so they can get to know me. I'm like, this is me Saturday, Sunday. Like it's not, you know, it, that's real life. <laughs> like <laughs> it's real life. But I think like that's the point is that you've got to slow down to find those moments. Okay, so it's bathroom talks, cost no money. Um, I so I follow a keto. I just want to be clear, we're not promoting this from an HR standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> it's only it's you're always in the bathroom yeah, sauce. Anyway. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, I think the other piece is like you know let people know stuff about yourself and your quirks. Um, I eat a keto diet, so everyone's like, what's keto? No sugar. So I'll bring them in snacks and I'll tell them about, it and they think it's fascinating and weird at the same time, but they they enjoy that piece of it. Um, I you know I I. Uh, we, we do parades, and we make sure that everyone shows up with parades. Marla's group's been great about any kind of fundraisers we're doing or, like, group activities we're doing where everyone gets villager um, shirts and everyone can wear their shirts. And it's little things like that that add up. We have Wednesday Wando lunches in Blaine where everyone gets Wandos and just these crazy little things that start to build the culture very, very slowly. Um, lunch costs not a lot bathroom talks are free but it's like these little things where you're getting glimpses of personalities outside of the banker talk that I think is really important I yeah just I mean to on that so ideas that that we've seen and clients are things like um, establishing more of a formal coaching or mentoring program for younger employees or employees that are newer to the organization almost to like walk the walk right and show them what it looks like um, you know, you talked about, I, everything you talk about, I just keep hearing the word vulnerability in my head. As, as, as leaders, it's, it's really being vulnerable and sharing our stories and our successes and our failures and that we're human and we go home and put sweats on and, you know, all of that. And so a couple ideas there is that have really worked for our clients are, you know, CEO or leadership breakfasts where it's, it's you know, you and five or six people max for your organization or even maybe just a few and kind of rotating that monthly where it's a privilege to be part of that. But the whole agenda is around what's working and not working, right? Like open up because at a town hall for the whole bank or for the whole organization, they're probably not gonna raise their hand and talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, but if we ask the right questions, oftentimes they will give us the answers that we need to be able to make changes. Um, and then sharing stories. So we had um, a client that started doing, so video is really big. Right, if you think about the next generation of our workforce, they really like to receive information that way. And so we had a CEO who started recording videos once a week, kind of from the desk of, you know, what are the thoughts on his mind and what's keeping him up at night or what's he thinking about? And he started sending those out once a week and people won't, they don't miss them, right? They open the email and they can't wait because it's a little self-deprecating and it's a little bit, you know, but it shows him as a human and they actually start to hear the things that keep him up at night. And what it's caused is people coming back to him to say, you don't need to worry about that. Like, did you realize we have this and this in place or we could do this that would actually make that better? And he, they're like innovating just based on the things that he's, the problems that he's talking about, mm -hmm. right? And the things he's thinking about. So those are just a few that came to mind. And the only other two I'll add is um, as part of an organization <coughs> that had a fund committee and had a volunteer committee. So those committees were initially head up by um, kind of the co-CEOs, but eventually they turned it over to other people to take mm -hmm. over. So it, it was something that initially started off with, with them, but then grew into something that had a completely different life of its own, right? And so it was more dictated by the people who raised their hand and said, yes, I want to be part of the volunteer committee and help shape some of the things that we're doing, giving back as an organization. Or the fun committee of, like, I want to help plan you know, because we, we would do these these fun events like once a quarter. And um, and I think then that way there's a different set of buy-in when it comes from the committee that's planted versus, well, you know, my boss said I have to go to this, you know, twist mm -hmm. game or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. like, I have to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you do have those. Can I, one more thing I did. I totally forgot about this. So we had this, we had an FDAC exam coming up. We had these ticklers we want to get done. This is all banking talk. 
but our team like killed it like they got all this stuff done they did such a great job it was right before Christmas so I grew up because values are really important to me and legacy is really important to me um, I grew up doing all these parades and I can literally remember being like five and six and being in all these parades throwing out candy when you could throw candy now you're supposed to throw put on the ground right and I'm always like just chuck one piece Nina but um and so I remember doing this and how important it was and how I really want to instill this in my kids and so the company did this tickler project and they killed it they did awesome so for Christmas on Christmas Eve the bank is open till noon who wants to work till noon on Christmas Eve I mean what is that right I know we need to get some cash but we got to work on that um, and we and so we're open till noon so I said all right Nina we're gonna go get Hans bakery donuts which is client and in our area and we said we're gonna go get Hans bakery donuts and we're gonna go out and we're gonna go visit every location we're gonna give gifts out to the people that worked on this project so they all got tickle me Elmo's Nina and I got to do the values piece of it and go out together and it brought no one expected us to see us there on Christmas Eve because well we shouldn't have to work on Christmas Eve yeah I do if you do I do right like the banks open and and it was so special because my dad actually then met us at one of our last locations and we took this picture by the Christmas tree and it was awesome it's it's what the village is about and like th I think it wasn't just what we saw but it was what other people got to see too because they're getting this tickle me Elmo doll which they're like what but then they love it and they have it on their desks but then they were also getting to see that like it's not just our family but it's like the 80 plus families that we have there too and that they matter too and when they have to show up guess what so do we it's part of the job so that was a fun one that was a good one so I don't think we can talk about uh, culture without talking about the differences in recruiting and uh, retaining different generations. So if we could touch on that. I always worked at uh, places where they were with a whole bunch of young men that were always into happy hours. And I would always not be able to handle that very well. So what are the, what are the differences and what, how can we help with that? So this is a... This is a bit of a soapbox for me, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, generational changes. They've happened forever. There's a lot of people and a lot of books and people are making a lot of money talking about the drama between the generations, right? So there it is real. It's a generational change. But what I think is, is funny on this, I'm just going to go a little bit. So I have a, a great-grandmother that she'll be 103 in October right, still living in town, and if you talk to her about the generational changes, she says, what do you think we thought in the 60s? <laughs> we thought that generation was going to destroy us, like it was the end, right, this is the end, we're done, right, and so you, if you think through, right, and so this is kind of off your question, but the millennials are not the end of life as we know it, <laughs> so just to be clear for everyone, um, so yes, they are different, Yes, they are challenge seekers. Yes, they can work hard when they are challenged and there is a purpose to what they are doing. They will blood, sweat, and tears for your company. What we have to start realizing is they are 75% of the workforce by 2025. So the businesses that want to keep talking about how to work with them have to change their language to you will work with them. They will be running your company in the next 10 years. So we have to get over the, 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 what we're marking them as and try, f try to figure out how to actually draw in their strengths and really use them as a competitive advantage because it's there. And, and so that's just my soapbox about the generation changes. I'll let you guys talk about recruiting, but you got to think about it differently, you guys. We can't make it as dramatic as it's been. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I would love just to get a, a show of hands uh, who works in an organization that has kind of a hard and fast, like you must be in at this time, and you're kind of shunned if you leave before this time. Anyone? Depending on the job, role, but yeah. yeah. OK, so that is the biggest struggle that I'm seeing in the market right now, is that we've got some very traditional, I mean, that's just you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. banking, right? Mm -hmm. I have some, some companies that are you know, in uh, manufacturing um, mm -hmm. that it's almost like a badge of honor for the leadership. Like, well, this is what I've done for 20 years and now I'm at, you know, I'm in the CFO spot or the CEO spot, so they're gonna have to do the same thing. 
And that's the biggest frustration that I have is just sharing that our world is changing mm -hmm. dramatically. And it's, you know, whether they're a millennial, whether a Gen Zer, what they might even be a baby boomer, but people are needing more flexibility. And with the ability to work pretty much anywhere on our phones, mm -hmm. um, that is what I'm seeing as one of the biggest deterrents from the, to call it the, the Gen Zers, you know, the, the ones that are coming out of the workforce right now, is, is the ability to say, well, if I can get this job done in six hours a day, isn't that a good thing? <laughs> and granted, yes, you might still need to stay. Um, or you might be getting some additional projects, but it's the realization that like, maybe we do need to think through like, what our strategy is to, if we want to attract that kind of talent. If you don't want to attract that talent, fine, shut that door, but know that it's going to be really hard yeah, to find. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, there's a question. Well, I was just wondering, along those same lines, if you wouldn't mind commenting on, you know, the changes in the marketplace, and by that I mean, since we're clearly moving into a gig economy, and we're talking about culture eating strategy for breakfast or lunch, or maybe even dinner, if you would mind talking from your various perspectives about that. The remote work, you know, it's not just remote, it's a gig economy where so yeah. many of us are going to be working. Yeah, so the gig economy is people le leaving full-time roles to do something part-time or really on their own in their area of expertise, a fractional work. Yeah, so you're, you're seeing this a, a lot, and the numbers are, are really proving. Um, I, I'm, I continue to be staggered by the amount of people that reach out to us that have just jumped out. They just left their corporate role because they're like, I'm just not doing it anymore, right? And I'll figure it out kind of thing. Um, and so it's happening almost at an alarming rate it, because they don't then necessarily know how to manage you know what they want to do but there is a real opportunity for um, for companies to engage those people they don't have to be I mean our company is is over half consultants right but they want to be part of our culture and they are part of our our, our culture so you don't have they don't have to be w2 employees for you to use them to leverage right and really be able to bring different ideas to the table so I don't know if that answers your question but I think it's the way you employ people and your mix of employees and, and non-employees is, is going to have to change. I mean, the big companies are already doing it and looking at it. Medtronic, I think, announced that by 20, I'm, all statistics are made up usually, but I'm, I'm going to make up something like 60% of their workforce they expect to be contract labor in the next 15 years. Okay, we love those people because they're called prospects. So they're just starting new businesses. We think they're great. Everyone should quit and go start a business and we'll finance you, right? They're Again, awesome. This is not real <laughs> advice. That we're gonna Are you sure? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I, um, we're, right now we're using four different consultants for pieces that we don't have an expertise in and we're not going to hire a full-time person for. We know it's a point in time that we need an expertise for and to go to get the training for current villagers where we need them in a different position or to try to bring on someone that's you know benefits highly highly paid for a specific skill set doesn't make sense for us May maybe for well it does but it doesn't make sense for us we don't want to have to lay people off in the future so we're using four consultants right now that I they're you know one two man bands and it works great for us I, so I know that we're hiring those people and we are also financing people like that. One more commercial. Um, what I, I going back to this piece though, it's so interesting because um, I think of our teller and our relationship bankers. Those are like bankers out front. They're helping you through your car loan, your personal loan, et cetera, your personal account. If you had a question on it, when you know, I've watched how we've hired and I've watched what we've done, and um, I think it's really important for those entry level positions that aren't you know, highly paid, they're not, um, you know, we tend to see turnover on our front line more often than we would in another level or a different department, really getting back to how do we turn them into lifelong villagers, right? And that's been so important for us. Um, and I think this is important to say that I don't care what millennial, what Gen Z, what I don't care, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, I don't care what it is, none of that matters. 
how do you make people feel part of what you're doing? And if they're part time, they have no benefits, they're not with like, how do you get them engaged in your culture? How do we t hire full time tellers who maybe they're in college, maybe they're graduating from college, they've got benefits, they're committed to us, we're showing them the different tracks they could take. It's not teller to relationship ba banker, maybe it's teller to credit analyst, right? Wow. How are we showing these people that there's a lot of different things they could do at their village because then they're loyal and they're committed to us and they might not make that change to go out on their own or start something new. Um, on the flip side, we got to remember that if you're going to be a mom or your wife gets a great big job and you're going to stay part time or whatever you're going to do, that we're also going to then make that commitment as people move up the ladder too to say you're someone we don't want to lose. How do we make this work for you in this moment of time? Or how do we make it work for you for whatever that is that you want to do? How do we transfer those that skill set so we can still keep you, um, but we can make sure that you're living the life you want to outside of our village as well? I think that's so important to remember. I mean, it really flips both ways, right? Giving those new people the great opportunities, but then people that have been committed and loyal to you, you don't you don't forget what's important to them either. Well, it's just about one. Do you have just one? Well, I have a comment and more of a uh, kind of a question for Jamie. You mentioned <coughs> millennials. I consider millennials the 18 to 34. And yes, they will work hard. I've also thought about the younger millennials expect, almost sometimes expect, the world owes them something. Have you found out that the younger millennials, some of them, think that the world owes them a living? They don't have to work hard. I mean, in our generation, I guess I was raised that you have to work an hour. If you want to get an hour wage, you have to work that hour. Or I know there's more virtual assistants and stuff like that, and you can get your big done in six hours versus eight. Just finding out that the younger the millennials are, the more they think that they don't have to work hard. Have you known it, found that out? Okay, I gotta answer this. So, okay, what, when I was 18 to 34 or whatever that box is, I didn't wanna work hard either. You did owe me everything. I was 18 to 34. I mean, like, that's called being young. Like, that's called being naive. That's called any generation. And so, that's where I was like, whoa, let's ever give everyone a chance. Let them get married, let them have kids, let them move to the suburbs. It will change, <laughs> they'll, they'll have a mortgage, they'll have diapers, like, that's the piece that I think we all forget. There was all a point in time where we didn't realize how hard we were gonna have to work. We didn't realize we had to have insurance and gas and pay for college and have a 529 account. So I think that that's where your advice was true, whether it's a 103 year old grandma or it's the 18 year old with the internship that doesn't wanna work hard. I mean, it's called like for, it's just called life cycle, right? And it's called, until you got that responsibility. And I agree with you, and I, that's why I knew you could answer it because we've had this we've had this discussion, and, and and this is really what I was talking about with with people digging in to understand more because I think that's the part of it's part of it's real, and it's what Alicia's talking about, but part of it's also drama that I think is being stirred up. I truly, truly believe the millennials' values, core values, are not any different at the core than the baby boomers that are struggling with them right now. Here's the difference. The millennials have been taught to not be afraid to talk about them and to not be, and they have a platform. My phone's not in front of me, but they have a platform and they've grown up with a platform to tell everybody how they feel and when they're happy and sad. And it's not right or wrong, it's just the world they grew up in. And so realize that their values are not different necessarily, it, but how we actually utilize those values and make them, you know, where they're not just going to come in and soldier on and keep your head down and get a paycheck. That is not their generation. We didn't, te we didn't teach them that, just to be clear. We didn't teach them that. So we just have to think about it differently and how do we utilize them and motivate them. You know, I, I, we've got millennials on our team that are harder workers than I am. So you guys, you can you can do it. You just have to change your mindset a little bit. That's I don't know if that answers your do, question. Do you know some companies that take their um, their new kind of new grads and put them through a pretty extensive training program? Yeah. And part of that includes saying, like basically everything that you were taught is. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I say that it, it kind of, again tongue in cheek, but but you know again, you know looking at 
Like I, you know, the you get a trophy for everything for, for participating. What yeah. the reason that you were hired here is because of X Y Z. What you need to do over the next six months is basically listen more than you talk. Right, and like just training them on what it means yep. to behave in this environment because they don't know other otherwise. And, but that's a behavior, not a value. That's what I'm saying is their values aren't broken. The behaviors that we're, right? And we have to show, we have to show them that. That's our jobs as leaders. We don't. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you for coming, everyone.